All right. Okay, we'll get started. Um, so, hello and welcome, everyone, to Serialize All the Things with JSON.net. So, uh, first off, I thought I'd introduce myself. Uh, my name is James Newton King. I'm from New Zealand. It's not quite on the opposite side of the world as Norway, but it's close. So, you may have seen New Zealand. If you've ever seen Flight of the Concords, these are some fantastic demotivational posters they have on that show. So it's like Scotland, but a lot further. So I've been a uh, .NET developer for just over 10 years, and about eight years ago I started an open source framework called JSON.NET, um, which we're going to talk about today. So a, a show of hands first. Um, so who, who's used JSON.NET? Awesome. Okay, so um, we're going to start off, uh, well, this, this talk's going to cover everything from the basics, and then we're going to sort of touch on some of the more advanced JSON.NET features uh, where we've got time. do is jump into uh, why, why use JSON when we've already got XML. Um, so a couple of uh, features are commonly cited when talking about JSON. So the first one is, is that JSON is generally smaller than XML. Um, and that's especially true when you take into account stuff like XML declaration and namespaces. Uh, XML, uh, JSON is also a lot simpler than XML. Um, so the JSON spec can literally be represented on the back of a business card. Um, and there's this quote from Douglas Crockford, uh, JSON is the fat-free alternative to XML. So all those um, features are uh, valid and true. Um, JSON is smaller, it is simpler. Um, but I think the real reason why JSON has succeeded over XML is um, JSON has the concept of types. A uh, class, a, a simple person class. And then we've got some XML from it. Uh, the thing about XML is XML is really just a tree of nodes, um, which is great. You can represent pretty much any data with a tree of nodes. But it doesn't map to programming data types. Um, a, a class in .NET or a dictionary is a collection of name values. Uh, a tree of nodes doesn't represent name values at all. You can do it, but we need to invent a way to represent that. So we've got some XML here, which um, has a collection of people classes, person classes in it, uh, and it's sort of got its own syntax for representing a name and representing a value. In this case, we've got a name in the element, and we've got the value in the text. You could also represent that same person class like this. If you like your app settings out of a web config file, you could do it like this. If you're a masochist and you like the data contract serializer, you could serialize it like this. The problem is, is there's all these different ways of doing it. There's no one fixed way, which means when we're serializing to and from XML, we need to specify a lot of additional configuration on how we want to serialize and deserialize XML. If we compare that to JSON, so there's an impedant mismatch between our data um, and our programming language and XML. If we compare that with JSON, JSON has a concept of names, it has a concept of um, values, it has a concept of arrays. There's no way we need to sort of figure out how we want to represent this data. Um, JSON specifies it for us. And if we compare that to the same data in C Sharp, so this is a C Sharp anonymous object. Uh, it's pretty much, it pretty much looks exactly the same. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between our um, data that we're serializing and the format that we want to serialize to. And this means JSON is much, much better at representing the data types that we have in programming languages, which really, when it come down, comes down to it, classes are name value. We have dictionaries uh, that are name value. We have arrays, which are really just a list. Then we have our primitive types, our strings, our integers, null, boolean, and so on. So that's why uh, JSON is better than XML. Why is JSON.NET better than the data contract serializer? So the data contract serializer um, shipped in .NET 3. It's part of WCF. Uh, this is a uh, some uh, demo code of serializing, in this case, a movie object into a JSON string. So we need to start off with a, a, a memory stream. We need to declare a, uh, a data contract serializer 
and specify the type that we want to serialize. In this case, a movie. We need to write our movie object to our memory stream. This is all very OO. Um, because we've written to our stream, we're now at the end of the stream. We need to seek back to the beginning. We convert our um, memory stream of bytes back into an array of bytes, and then we get our uh, encoding, UTF-8 in this case, and we get our JSON string. Now, I don't know about you, but that code, um, there's a whole bunch of internal craft that we really don't care about. And I think this illustrates the problem with the data contract JSON serializer. Um, it's designed to be used with WCF. It's not flexible in how it serializes JSON. It's not flexible in what it works with. It expects classes to be in a very specific format, and it only outputs JSON in one in its own format. So if we compare that to JSON.NET doing the same task, it's really just a helper method. We're still doing all that same logic, but it's happening inside this helper method. And I think that flows through to JSON.NET's philosophy. You give it any type, it will serialize it, serialize all the things. If you want to serialize it in a specific way, chances are there's a configuration setting in JSON.NET to help you do that. So some more information about JSON.NET. It was first released in 2006, the same year that the um, JSON specification was um, written by Douglas Crockford. Um, it works in every framework from .NET 2 and above, so .NET 2, 3, 4, 4.5. It works on Windows Phone, Windows 8, Mono, Mono Touch, Mono Droid. If you really want to, you can use it in Silverlight. It's had 6 million downloads since 2006. Um, right now on NuGet, although a lot of these are package restores, it gets about a million downloads every two months. And it's used in a lot of um, big frameworks um, by large companies. So Microsoft uses it in MVC, uh, I mean Web API. Um, Microsoft uses it in SignalR. Um, Google uses it in all their .NET client libraries when talking to their um, web services. Um, RavenDB is a .NET JSON database, and it uses JSON.NET to handle its JSON, and it's certainly the most complex um, use of JSON.NET I've seen. So our agenda for today is I'm going to cover the main parts of the um, JSON.NET architecture. So firstly, we'll look at the JSON serializer. So the serializer is all about developer efficiency. It's about quickly serializing strongly typed .NET objects to JSON and back again. Uh, then we'll talk about linked to JSON. So linked to JSON is about working with untyped JSON. So this is good when um, your JSON either doesn't map well to objects or you don't want to define .NET objects for all the JSON you want to work with. Maybe you're only interested in a very specific piece that's deeply nested. And then we'll look at JSON schema. So JSON schema is separate to the core JSON specification. Um, it's its own spec, and it's currently in uh, work in progress. Um, so JSON schema is very similar to XML schema. Um, like XML schema validates JSON, uh, XML, JSON schema validates JSON. And uh, don't be afraid, because it's much, much better than XML schema. So the first thing we'll look at is the JSON serializer. So the JSON serializer is all about quickly converting JSON to .NET objects and then .NET objects, um, creating .NET objects from JSON. Um, it's all about developer efficiency. Um, if you've already got your .NET objects and you want to serialize them, um, like you saw earlier, it's really just a one-line method call. Um, the JSON serializer is highly configurable. So um, although um, JSON maps well to .NET types, there's always slightly different ways you want to serialize things, um, so especially dates. Um, JSON doesn't handle dates very well, and the JSON serializer has a lot of configuration settings to help you, uh, help you with that. Uh, the JSON serializer also supports uh, attributes. So attributes are great when you want to um, customize the JSON that you're producing on a type-by-type -type basis or a, um, even a property-by-property -property basis. So that compares to the settings, which are really global for whatever you're doing right now with um, the JSON serializer. And then finally, I'll talk about um, JSON converters. So JSON converters are there for when there's something you can't do um, by configuration. Um, they're really your sort of get out of jail free card if, if you ever get to the point where there's a class which you just 
see no way that you can serialize it using the JSON serializer. Um, you can manually specify how it should be read and written to JSON using a JSON converter. So I think the, the first thing we'll talk about, and I think key to understanding and using the serializer um, well, is understanding how .NET types uh, map to JSON and back again. So anything which implements I enumerable will be serialized as a JSON array. So if you've got a list or an array, or you've got your own custom object and you make it implement I enumerable, um, it will start becoming an array in JSON. Um, if you've got your own custom object and you make it implement uh, I enumerable, and you've got custom properties that you want serialized as well, um, you can't really do that because, as you can see, see um, a, a JSON array really only supports values inside it. It doesn't support values inside it plus name values as well. So um, dictionaries are serialized as JSON objects. So the, uh, the key is the name, and then the value becomes the value. Uh, one thing to note is if you've got a key which isn't a string, because JSON names have to be strings, um, the key of the dictionary will be converted to a string. Um, in this case, it's a uh, date time, and it's converted to a, uh, into an ISO formatted string. If you had a number, it would just JSON.net would just call toString on your number. If you pass in a custom class, it will call toString on your custom class. So you need to implement um, toString on your custom class if you want to use it um, inside a dictionary and have it make sense when serialized to JSON. And then most other custom classes, structs, anonymous types, those are, are really just serialized as objects as well. The, the, the name of a property or field will be the name of a JSON, and then the value um, will be the value in the JSON. Uh, one thing to note is by default JSON.NET will serialize um, only public uh, properties with getters. If you want to serialize a private property, um, you can do that, but you need to specify it manually, manually with an attribute. And then finally, most of the .NET primitive types map how you'd expect to be a JSON equivalent. So a .NET string becomes a JSON string. Um, integer values become a JSON integer. Um, so floating point numbers and decimals become a JSON float. So JSON in the specification doesn't really have a differentiation between integers and floats. Uh, what JSON.NET does is any floating point value or decimal value, it will always ensure it ends with a, uh, it always will have a decimal point. Even if it's decimal point of dot zero, um, JSON.NET will add it for you just so you can differ differentiate between the two. So this is especially useful when you want to come and deserialize. When JSON.NET sees that it has that decimal point in it, it will deserialize that type as a, as a single, double, or decimal. Uh, date times will be serialized in, as an ISO string. And enumerations will be serialized as an integer, so the integer value of the enumeration. So I put um, stars against date time and enum because JSON.NET ships with um, JSON converters for customizing how those are serialized. So, for example, date time, JSON.NET ships with a JavaScript uh, date time converter. And when you use that when serializing, um, your date time will be serialized as a, uh, as a um, JSON constructor. So it will be new date, then it will have the ticks. So those Unix, Unix ticks. Um, and then with enum, JSON.NET ships with a string enum converter. So instead of serializing the uh, integer value, it will serialize the um, enumeration name. So the, probably the most used method call in JSON.NET is uh, JSON convert .serialize object. And this is, it's very simple. All you do is you get your .NET object, you pass it to serialize object, and it will return a JSON string. Uh, probably the second most um, used call is serialize object and then passing in um, a setting to control the indentation. So this is just an overload to um, serialize object, and if you pass this in, instead of um, producing 
uh, quite compact JSON. Um, instead, JSON.NET will indent it, will put each property on a new line. Uh, it will make it much easier to read, um, especially if you've got a large object or you've got deeply nested objects. Um, it's bigger than if you did it without the uh, uh, formatting uh, indented option, but it's much easier to, to debug and understand. So if you have more advanced settings that you want to pass to JSON.NET um, and the serializer using this um, serialize object helper method, uh, there's a JSON serializer settings object. And again, you just set the properties on it that you want to pass to the serializer, and the serializer will use them. So in this case, there's that JavaScript date time converter that we talked about. Instead of our date being serialized as a string, it's now serialized as a uh, JavaScript uh, constructor call. Uh, technically, this isn't valid JSON, but it's up to you if you want to use it. So inside the um, serialize object method, there's um, this, this is pretty much is what is going on. Uh, so this is kind of similar to what you saw with the data contract serializer, data contract JSON serializer code um, I showed you before. Um, we're creating a place where we write our JSON to. In this case, it's a string writer. Uh, we're creating a, uh, Java, a, a JSON serializer. We're serializing our object to our um, destination, in this case, the writer. And then we're just calling to string. Uh, it's useful to understand what is going on here. Um, perhaps not in this case, in the case of a string, because you've already got um, this helper method. You don't really need to um, do it. Uh, recreate it yourself. But in cases where you don't want to work directly to or from a string, um, Using the, the JSON serializer can be much more efficient. So in this case, instead of a um, string writer, we're working with a stream writer. So we're creating a stream writer, um, which is pointing to a new file on disk. We're serializing, but instead of serializing to a string, we're serializing directly to that file. Um, so this is good, because we're not having to go through the overhead of creating that string in memory. and it's potentially much faster. Um, this isn't terribly useful, maybe if you're just writing a five kilobyte JSON string, but if you're writing a five megabyte JSON string and you've got a high capacity server, um, this will save you allocating a lot of unnecessary objects. It will save you um, also garbage collecting them as well. So if you're, if you're generally, if you're working with small objects, small JSON, using that helper method is fine. If you're working with larger ones, you might want to think about using the JSON serializer directly. Deserializing, um, there's pretty much an equivalent method of serialize object called deserialize object. It works much the same. You give it the JSON instead of the object, but you need to specify the object that you want. You need to do this because JSON doesn't contain any type information. It will return the object, and you're done. Again, uh, there's an overload which takes settings. Just pass it the settings that you want to use, and JSON.NET will deserialize your JSON. Uh, one um, not very well-known um, helper method on JSON convert is populate object. While uh, deserialize object creates a new object, populate object can take uh, takes an existing object as an argument, and then will populate uh, values from that JSON onto your object. So this is, in, in this case, we're creating a session, we're setting the date, but we're then getting the name of the session from our JSON. But date is staying unchanged. So it's, it's useful, it's not something you'd want to use every day, but it's, it's good to know that it's there. So there's a lot of serialization settings. Uh, this is every single one that I could find. Um, as you can see, there's dozens, and there's nowhere near enough, there is nowhere near enough time to go through them all. Um, but at a high level, most of these just customize what is serialized by JSON.NET and how it is serialized. Um, uh, uh, we'll go through a couple of examples using um, some of these settings. Um, but if you want to know more about them, I recommend just taking a look at the documentation. So our first example will be how we can use settings to reduce the um, JSON that we're serializing. Obviously, if you're pushing JSON down to a mobile client, you don't want to push uh, megabytes or even hundreds of kilobytes of JSON. You want to push only what you need. 
So in this case, we're creating an employee. We're setting first name, last name, then we're serializing it. Um, by default, JSON.NET will serialize all public properties, even if the value hasn't been set. So in this case, our employee has a first name and last name set. Uh, birth date is just the default value. Um, department, that string is null, and job title is null. Uh, we can use a um, serialization setting called null value handling to ignore our null values. So by adding that, JSON.NET will ignore serializing any property which has a null value on it. And already our JSON is a bit smaller. Another setting which is similar to that is default value handling. Uh, the idea is pretty much the same. So our, our date value, which has a uh, default value, as soon as we put default value handling on to ignore, um, it's no longer serialized. And finally, um, we can change formatting from indented to um, yeah, none. And our, our end result is much, much smaller than what we started with. So using setting, it's, it's very quick to globally change how JSON is serialized. And we've cut the size of this JSON in half of just a couple of lines. So our next example is um, how we can use um, serializer settings to help round trip .NET objects when serializing them and deserializing them. So imagine we've got a employee class and we've got a manager that inherits from employee. And the manager has a list of employees who report to him or her. So here we just create some instances of our object. So we've got Arnie Admin, who's just an employee. We've got Mike Manager, who is a manager. Susan Supervisor, also a manager. Then we set up some reporting relationships, and then we serialize our, uh, our Mike Manager object. So that JSON is pretty much what you'd expect. You've got Mike Manager in there. He's got some reports. He's got Arnie Admin reporting to him. He's got Susan Supervisor reporting to him. Then Arnie's reporting to Susan. There's a couple of problems with this when we want to deserialize. So the first one is, is that when we try and deserialize, uh, Susan's supervisor will be deserialized as an employee and not a manager. Now the reason this happens is by default, JSON doesn't include any type information. And all JSON.NET knows is you want to deserialize a list of employees. So it will say, fine, I will deserialize you an employee. So already we've lost some information there. Uh, the second problem is, although we started off with one instance of Arnie Admin, we've now ended up with duplicate objects in our JSON. Now, this is fine if all you're doing is serializing um, some JSON and then reading it, perhaps in JavaScript. But when you come to deserialize, you'll now have duplicate Arnie Admin, ob Arnie admin um, employees, uh, one reporting to what Mike Manager, one reporting to Susan Supervisor. So the way we fix these two problems is with uh, two settings on the JavaScript serializer. Uh, the first one is type name handling. So by specifying type name handling, type information has been added to our JSON. So in the case of Mike Manager, he is now a he's, there's JSON to say that he's a manager against this dollar type property. Um, for Arnie Admin, He's an employee, and Susan's supervisor is a manager. Now when we deserialize, JSON.NET will look at these attributes and will create that exact type. So we'll now, we'll now successfully get back um, exactly the types that we serialized. Our second setting is preserve reference handling. By enabling this for objects, this $ID attribute is added to each object that we serialize. So this ID um, is to identify the object reference identifier. So you notice um, Mike Manager has one, uh, Arnie Admin has two, and Susan Supervisor has three. But when we come to serialize Arnie Admin again, when he reports to Susan Supervisor, rather than duplicating the values, we've just got a reference back to the um, first Arnie Admin object. And then when we come and deserialize, we successfully get back what we put in, what we started with. So Susan Supervisor is now successfully a manager. Our two Arnie Admin uh, instances are both pointing at the same object.
are um, serialization settings. Um, serialization attributes are useful for when we want to customize our JSON at a um, type by type or property by property level. So probably the, the most used or one of the most used is the JSON ignore attribute. If you have a .NET object and it has a property on it that you don't want to serialize, just place the JSON ignore attribute on it and it won't be serialized. There's the JSON property attribute. The JSON property attribute can be used to customize how a property is serialized. So if you want to customize the name, um, if you want to customize something else about it, so many of those serialization settings that you saw against the serializer can be specified on a property by property basis. There's the JSON object and JSON array attributes. So these can be placed on classes to force it to either be serialized as an object or as an array. So if you had um, your own .NET class and it implemented iEnumerable, but you didn't want it serialized as an array by placing JSON object, the JSON object attribute on it, it will force it to be serialized as an object and vice versa with an uh, array. And then there's the JSON converter attribute. So you saw JSON converters being used earlier. The JSON converter attribute allows you to apply, apply attributes on a property by property and class by class basis. So we'll jump into examples of how to use, well, of, of serializa serialization attributes being used. So imagine we have a house. In this case, it's Sherlock Holmes' house. And we're serializing it. So by default, we're serializing everything. They're all public properties. They all have getters. They're all serialized. So if we want to ignore some of those attributes, we just place the JSON ignore attribute on them. And JSON.net will automatically and for all time now just ignore those when serializing our um, instance of a house. Another way of doing the same thing and getting the same result is by changing our JSON object, well, changing our object serialization from instead of being opt out to being opt in. So by default, JSON.NET does opt out serialization. It will serialize all the properties on a class except those that have been opted out by the JSON ignore attribute. Opt in works the opposite way and sort of more the way that WCF works. It will only serialize properties that have a JSON property attribute on it. Uh, this is perhaps um, better in this example, than, uh, uh, this is better than what we were doing previously because we don't need to put rem remember to put JSON ignore on every single new property that we add to our class. We just need to say it's opt-in, we put JSON property on the one property that we want to serialize and then any additional properties that are added in the future are just automatically not serialized. Uh, here we are now customizing the, the name of the uh, property that's been serialized. It's also po possible to customize other things about it. So now we're customizing both the name and the order that they're serialized in. So if you want to customize the order, you can do that using a JSON property. Um, a lot of those um, serializer settings that you saw earlier can be applied at a property by property basis. So if you want to set default value handling or null value handling on an individual property, you can do that using the um, JSON property attribute. And then finally, there's the JSON converter attribute. So JSON converter lets you customize a converter against one particular property or against a particular, a particular type. Um, if we had multiple um, dates on this house uh, class and we were serializing all of them and we only had the JSON converter attribute on this one particular property, the other um, dates would be unaffected. So the final piece that we'll talk about, uh, the final piece of the um, JSON uh, serializer functionality that we'll talk about is uh, JSON converters. So as you've seen, the JSON serializer has very set rules about how it serializes and deserializes types. Anything with iEnumerable is an array. Uh, dates are always ISO strings. Um, classes are always um, objects. Uh, JSON converters allow you to completely customize how types are serialized. Um, so they give you complete control over both serialization and deserialization. Um, JSON converters, um, you can create them to work with any type. So 
you don't need to control the source code for a type to be able to create a JSON converter for it. Um, if you want to create a JSON converter for .NET strings, and the JSON converter will always serialize strings in reverse and deserialize them and reverse them back again, you can do that if you want. Yeah, you can control serialization, deserialization, deserialization or both. Um, you don't need to implement both ways with a JSON converter. As long as, um, you convert, as long as you implement what you're using, then that's fine. Example, so in this case, we've got a HTML color class that we've created, and we're serializing that in our pretend element, and then we're getting our result. Now, this perhaps isn't what, we, what we'd expect. For an HTML color, perhaps we want it serialized as a HTML um, color hexadecimal string. Um, like you would see inside HTML. So this isn't what we want. So the way we get what we want is we implement a JSON converter. So the first step is to inherit from the JSON converter base class. Um, the first uh, method that we need to implement is the can convert method. So can convert. Um, when the serializer is, um, when the JSON serializer is serializing objects, it will call can convert on each object or value it encounters, and will say, JSON uh, converter, can you convert this type? And this can convert method um, will return either yes or no. So in this case, whenever the uh, JSON converter is given a type of HTML color, um, the can convert will return true. Uh, the next thing you need to implement is uh, write JSON. So in this case, we want to um, uh, use our JSON converter to customize how JSON is written. So write JSON takes a couple of arguments. Um, the ones that we care about in this case is JSON writer, um, which is um, what has been used to write the JSON, and our uh, value, which in this case has been passed in as an object. So the first step is to cast our value to HTML color. We know it will always be an HTML color because previously in can convert, we said this will only work with HTML color. Then when we then do our custom logic to convert the, um, the uh, HTML color to the format that we want. In this case, it's a hexadecimal string. And then with our JSON writer, we then write the value. In this case, we're just writing a string, but we could write any JSON that we want. We could write um, objects, we could write arrays, we could yeah, write anything. And then the, the final thing that we need to implement is read JSON. Uh, in this case, because we don't care about reading, we can just leave it throwing a not implemented exception. Um, as long as you don't try and use HTML color converter when deserializing JSON, read JSON will never be called, so it's, it's optional. And then vice versa with write, write JSON. As long as you don't use it when um, serializing, um, then you don't need to implement it. So here is our um, example updated. Um, we're now using our HTML color converter with our serializer settings, and our color, instead of what we were getting previously, our, um, our JSON object with that red, green, blue as properties, we're now getting it as as a hexadecimal string. So it's much easier to read, and even though the serializer is serializing the rest of our object using its default values, by using a JSON converter, we've completely customized that one individual class. So that's why I like to think as JSON converters as sort of your get out of jail free card. If you ever get into a situation where you've been using the JSON serializer a lot, and suddenly um, you hit a, a case where it just won't work for you, you can implement a converter and do whatever you want. A piece of JSON.net I'll talk about is um, linked to JSON. So linked to JSON is good when you're working with unstructured JSON. So if you don't want to create types, you don't already have types, if you've got an enormous piece of JSON and you only care about some deeply nested value, linked to JSON allows you to work with that JSON without creating types for each individual property and value and array and object and so on. Uh, as you might expect from a feature called link to JSON, it works very well with link. So it allows you to create, both create and query JSON um, with link very easily and quickly. And if you like to work with your JSON in C Sharp and pretend you're in JavaScript land and ignore types, 
Um, link to JSON supports the dynamic keyword. So in, in JSON, um, you can imagine most values, well, most, most data falling under one of three categories. You've either got primitive values, so strings, numbers, floats, booleans, and null. You've got arrays, which are really just a, a list of those values. And then you've got objects, which is a name and then a value. So link to JSON models that with J value, J array, and J object. And each of those then inherit from J token. So to jump into using those, um, using those types, imagine we have this JSON. Uh, it's an array. Uh, it's got two values in it. It's, they're, they're both um, floating point values. So the, the structure of that is a J array containing two J values. So the way we would create that um, using, um, using uh, link to JSON is we'd call the, the J value array constructor. We'd give it two values, or maybe a list of values from a query, a link query. And then we'd call to string, and that would produce the JSON that we started with. Working the other way, if we started with the JSON, just call jarray.parse, give it the JSON, and then we've got an array of those values. Um, jarray implements I, I list of J token. Um, you can work with it just like you would any other array in, uh, well, any other list in .NET. Um, so if you want to get a value from it, you just access its indexer. It will return a J token. Um, cast it to the type you want. There's um, uh, C sharp um, conversion methods for all the main .NET types. Um, it will create, it will convert it to the decimal, and then you can just start working with the with the decimal uh, in your .NET code. J object is very similar, so the only difference here is um, we have these J properties. So J property has the um, name of the property, but then a J property has its has its value. So when we're creating a, a J object, we give it, again, our collection of J properties with which have a, a name and a value. This could be um, specified like this in a params array. Um, you could have it as a list. You could have it as a result of a link query. And then again, if to, to get the JSON from your J object, just call to string on it. To go the other way, it's exactly the same as J array. Just call J object or parse, give it a JSON, and J object it implements I dictionary of J token. Well, string as the key and J token as the value. So just work with it like you would any other dictionary. So in this case, we're just accessing the dictionary indexer. It's going to return a uh, a value and just cast the value to what you want. So very simple to work with. So now that we know how to create our linked JSON objects, um, we can start querying and working with them. So uh, if we parse this um, link to, uh, if we parse this JSON into a JRay, uh, we can then start performing link operations on it. So JRay and JObject both implement um, uh, enumerable, and any link queries can work with them. So in this case, uh, when we do our where, our where is returning the um, objects contained within that array. So the two objects, um, they each have a title. So in our where, we just um, access our value from our um, object. Uh, since it's a dictionary, we cast it to string, and then we compare it with the result. And then in this case, it will return one result, our uh, JSON serializer basics. Uh, pretty much any any link query will work with link to JSON. So if you want to do an order by, again, it's the exact same thing. Access date um, from that dictionary, cast it to date time. Link will handle ordering it for you. If you want to do some sort of ad hoc deserialization, so if you don't want to use the JSON serializer, you'd rather use link to JSON to do your deserializing, you can using link. So in this case, we're selecting a strongly typed object from our, our link, to, link to JSON objects. And since in uh, linked JSON, um, everything implements uh, I enumerable, um, it's easy to do subqueries. So in this case, we're selecting from our, 
our post array, we've got our um, two objects again. They each have a category property on them. Um, we can then just do a, a subquery using link again on that um, categories um, array, and this time we're just testing to see um, which, uh, which posts have a category of link to JSON. So link to JSON um, implements dynamic. So this is um, what you've just been looking at now, uh, a standard way of working with a J object. If you don't want to work with um, a J ob object this way, if you want to pretend like you're in, in JavaScript land, you can just assign it to a, uh, a, dynamic, um, a dynamic reference, if, yeah, typed as dynamic, and you no longer need to um, put the uh, double quote dictionary indexes on it. Um, you don't need to wrap your array values in a JRay constructor. And when you're getting values out of your, um, your link to JSON um, objects, you no longer need to cast. Um, the, the dynamic um, implementation of link to JSON will handle doing those casts for you. And yes, much, much better if, if that's what you want. So there's good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is there's JSON schema. The good news is it's much better than XML schema. JSON schema is a yeah, JSON-based format for describing JSON data. So it's work in progress. Um, the specification for JSON schema is still in draft. JSON.NET supports draft 3. The current version is draft, draft 4. Uh, JSON schema is a community effort. So really, it's just a bunch of guys um, in, a, in a Google group discussing what it should look like. And pretty much anyone is uh, completely welcome to join in. Uh, JSON schema is actually quite popular. Um, in the next version of Visual Studio, Visual Studio um, uh, 2014, probably, or 15, we'll see. Um, uh, the uh, JSON schema editor will, uh, the JSON editor in Visual Studio will support validating using JSON schema, and it will support IntelliSense. And the way it will support IntelliSense will be using JSON schema. And there's implementations for pretty much every framework and language you can think of. The best way to uh, understand and get started with JSON schema is just look at examples. So in this case, we've got an object. The JSON schema object that would validate that is true is just a, a JSON object, this uh, type property, and then we specify the, the type of the thing that we're validating. In this case, it's object. So this would validate as true. If we had an array, again, we'd have a JSON schema object, and the type would be array. That would validate as true. Imagine we had an, an array again. This one's slightly more complex. Again, we've got that type um, property. We're saying in its array, but there's an, an additional type constraint on this array. We're saying that its items have to be of type integer. And if you look closely at this, you have one JSON schema object, and then you have a second one nested inside it. And again, for objects, if you want to be um, more advanced about how you constrain and validate that type, again, you have a JSON schema object with a type of object, and then you have this properties collection, which has the name of the property, and then it has a JSON schema object again of what it should validate as. So in this case, we've got string for the name, and we've got array for the hobbies. If we wanted to be more advanced, we could then specify the items, like we did on the uh, array above, and we'd say items have to be of type string. So really all JSON schema is, is this nested collection of these JSON schema um, validation objects, and it's, it's really quite simple. In a couple of type constraints, um, so for a string, if, you, if a type is string, you can specify a pattern on it, and whatever string you have there must match that 
regular expression pattern. You can also have a constrained set of enumeration values. Again, uh, if you have that, um, these are all optional. Um, whatever string you have must be one of those enumeration values. Uh, integer, you can specify a minimum and maximum. You can also say whether it's an exclusive minimum or an exclusive maximum. And number for floating points. Again, minimum, maximum, everything you can with integer, but there's this additional type constraint divisible by. So if you specify that, then whatever value of that whatever value of that number is, it must be divisible by whatever value you give it. In this case, by giving it 0 0.01, I've said uh, whatever number you have must be at, at maximum two decimal places, because if it's more than two decimal places and you divide it by um, this divisible by um, value, then you won't get uh, a result of zero and it won't pass. Uh, for Boolean and nullable types, um, they're slightly interesting in that there's no additional type constraints that you can apply to them. Uh, you will notice something new here. I've specified those types in an array. Um, on a JSON uh, schema object, if you specify multiple types in an array, then um, multiple types will match it. Any of, uh, in this case, uh, both a Boolean and a null is a valid um, value to be uh, validated by this uh, schema object. Uh, that's useful. Say, for example, if you had a, um, a, a .NET class which had a type a property with a type of nullable Boolean, um, the result when serializing that could be Boolean. It could also be null. So in that case, you'd want to have uh, multiple types specified uh, in, the, uh, in the schema object. Uh, object, most of these you've already seen. You have uh, properties, which have then uh, a name and then a, uh, a schema object for the value of that property. Um, a new setting here is additional properties. So um, speci specifying additional properties to false will limit um, what properties can be specified to only those ones that you've defined. So in this case, if you specify both name and age, um, it will be invalid because age would be an additional property. You've said you're not uh, those aren't allowed and you'll get a, a false result when validating. And then array, you've already seen items. You can also specify the, the maximum number of items and minimum number of items. So that's JSON schema in a nutshell. It's, it's not terribly complicated. Uh, using JSON schema within JSON.NET isn't very complicated either. So in this case, we've got our uh, JSON schema object. To use it, we simply parse it into a JSON schema class. Then for this example, we um, load, a, uh, load some JSON into a JObject class. And then we simply call isValid on, um, on our data class specifying our schema, and this overload happens to um, specify a, a collection of error messages. In this case, um, we validate to true. So um, name is a string, our, we have hobbies, it's an array, and it only has um, strings inside it. So in this case, our re result is true, and error messages would be uh, an, empty, an empty list. There wouldn't be any error messages in it. So imagine if we now change name to be null. So this would no longer pass validation. Uh, our um, name schema object only allows string. It doesn't allow string and null. If we validate it using JSON.NET, we get a result of false. And in our error messages collection, we get a description of why it failed. In this case, invalid type ex expected string dot null. And that's really all there is to using um, JSON schema with JSON.NET. Uh, JSON.NET uh, has a, a class in it called a JSON schema generator. So if you're just getting started with um, JSON schema uh, and you're not quite sure what your schema object should look like, um, this class is quite useful just for getting you uh, started. So all you need to do is um, new up an instance of it, uh, call schema generator dot generate and then give it the type that you want to uh, generate a uh, JSON schema for. It will return an object for you and that will be um, yeah, populated automatically with the properties and uh, the types uh, expected. 
So this is all just done using reflection. Um, uh, I would note that um, JSON schema generator isn't terribly flexible. So this is a good way to get you started, um, but you'd probably want to manually control your schemas and craft them by hand, or maybe use a more, more advanced uh, generator. So um, that's all for what I've covered with the, uh, I'm going to cover with JSON.NET today. Um, I thought for the remaining time we'll look at how to use JSON.NET with the main frameworks that use it. So um, ASP.NET Web API uses JSON.NET for all its uh, JSON serialization. So the way you um, customize JSON.NET with, uh, with Web API is um, simply in your global ASAX um, in the application start method. Um, just reference uh, the, the Web API namespaces and there'll be this global configuration static class. Um, this comes from Web API. Uh, it has a configuration on it. Uh, then it has a collection of formatters. Um, on that there's a JSON formatter um, property. And then on that there's a serializer settings. So serializer settings is what we saw um, right at the start. Uh, it's exactly the same as what you'd use with JSON convert. So simply set um, the properties that you want to use, uh, the settings that you want to use on, uh, on the, the serializer settings, and Web API will just automatically start using them. Uh, Signal R is quite similar. Um, so again, in global ASAX, an application start. Um, just new up some serializer settings, set the properties that you want to use, and then um, uh, ASP.NET SignalR has its own lightweight dependency injection framework. So just register um, a JSONNet serializer. So this comes with um, uh, SignalR and pass that the serializer settings you want to use and then SignalR will just automatically start using whatever, whatever you've given to it. So right now um, ASP.NET MVC doesn't use JSON.NET by default. Uh, what I have done is I've created a uh, JSON net result. So JSON net result is some custom code. Uh, it doesn't ship with JSON.NET, um, but it is available for download on, off uh, my blog. Um, so JSON net result is just an action result. Uh, it takes an object. It can also optionally take a serializer settings instance if you want to customize something. And it will just render um, your, well, when, when MVC talks to the action result and asks it to render itself, um, it will just call the JSON serializer and the JSON serializer will just write to the result and you'll get the uh, JSON back in your HTTP request. So uh, getting help with uh, JSON.NET, um, the best place to go is the JSON.NET website. So simply www.json.net. Um, the documentation on there is uh, quite comprehensive. So there's the uh, API documentation um, that you'll see in IntelliSense. There's about a dozen articles, so covering stuff about how to work with dates, um, how to work with attributes, um, some more advanced um, topics that we haven't had time to cover here today. And there's also um, over 100 samples. Uh, so those are pretty much the, the most used um, pieces of JSON.NET and pretty much if, if you can think of it, it's probably, uh, it's probably in there as a sample. Uh, the next place, place to go for help if you can't find what you're looking for in the documentation is uh, Stack Overflow. So if, uh, there's the, uh, if you search for the tag uh, json.net, um, there's thousands of, thousands of results. So there's almost 3,000 now. And uh, I'd recommend just searching what's already there. Um, chances are your question has already been answered, and if it hasn't, just create a new question, uh, tag it up with JSON.NET, and chances are you'll probably get a, 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 an answer fairly quickly. For JSON.NET today, um, uh, you've been uh, a great audience. Um, I'm going to be answering questions um, if you guys want to hang around and for the next five minutes, but uh, until then, uh, that's it. Thank you very much.
So if you've got any questions, um, yeah, just come up and ask me and uh, I'll answer.